Crypto Trader is proudly brought to you by Element, a full-service investment bank for the digital token capital markets. The Rothschilds were the godfathers of the traditional banking system. So it seems pretty apt that we start the second part of our Israel coverage right here on Rothschild Boulevard. This week we're going to get into the meat of things. We're going to see the projects in Israel and go and play in the sandbox for institutional investment. This is an episode you don't want to miss, so stay tuned. If you've been watching Crypto Trader lately, you'll see that we're one of the few outlets covering everything crypto related. We examine conferences, influencers, ICOs, regulation, speculation, institutions, devs code, and now of course blockchain use cases. This week we see actual working products built using blockchain. So Before launch, this is the lab. You'll meet Moshe Chogeg and his CERN lab's secret of cell phone. Armed. In a world exclusive, we'll debut the most eye-opening file compression software used building the blockchain. It'll make you think that Pied Piper may be real. Unbelievable. Forget about the blockchain <laughs> and the permissions and the tokens. And the You'll see just how big and ever-expanding eToro is. You'll meet orbs high above Tel Aviv, Saga, a standard setting stablecoin, and the much talked about Chrome Away project. You'll even find blockchain use cases in a UN Syrian refugee camp. This is part two of our coverage from Israel that's showing that we're in a serious build phase. So here is the blockchain in use, starting with Moshe Chogeg in his Tel Aviv tower. Moshe presides over Singularity, a fund that created CERN Labs, secretively sculpting its upcoming crypto cell phone. You'll see his holdings cross with this Gotham-like skyscraper and a similar set of dots in his office. So Moshe, when we asked who the biggest crypto investor in Israel was, all roads led here. So you, are you the biggest crypto investor in Israel? <laughs> it's a tricky question. I think my group and another group together are the biggest. So how did you get involved in investing in crypto? Yeah, so in, in our group, we, we're managing a VC, and we're very active, and uh, one of the technologies that we studied and, and really liked was Ethereum. And when we decided to invest in Ethereum from the fund, we discovered that legally we're not allowed to do that, which was a shocking surprise to us. Uh, but because it's not an an equity or any type of uh, legal formal asset class, uh, we reached this legal problem. So we thought, what can we do? We tried to get some uh, way around it. We couldn't. Ended up being upset and investing privately in that. And the rest was history. You know, Ethereum went crazy up. We got involved in the technology. We started to invest a lot in the entire space. Yeah, and we're very happy about it. So Alignment, is Alignment the, inve the crypto investment arm of the group? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and their investment thesis? You know, we usually invest in seed stage. And seed stage is very special. It's very unique, very different from different stages. So you need to really analyze the team, the character, a lot of psychology, not only hard numbers. We're usually investing in infrastructure. After wrapping up with Moshe, we went a few floors down to get a sneak peek at the much-anticipated Finny, a crypto-enabled cell phone. This is a crypto trade exclusive being unveiled for the first time by the project leads. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Nice Welcome. to see you again. Thank you. Nice to see you too. So is this where it all happens? Yes, this is Syrian Labs. The more important and interesting stuff is around this area where um, the R&D team resides and we have all the developers and the QA um, being done here. I can't show you too much because obviously these are our proprietary technologies, but you are, this is the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where uh, we test our technologies and currently uh, people are working on uh, the cold storage wallet. So this is where we try to make uh, the technological uh, magic happens. Um, ultra secure, 
And let me show you some uh, more interesting stuff. So basically, we are now here in the studio. So the Fini was designed here in the studio. Uh, we have uh, very professional and capable um, product designers working here. And the studio is basically managing um, the brand guidelines in terms of the visuals. You can see also the legacy and the evolution, for example, um, of our first product. You can see where uh, the Fini form factor came from. Let's go sit down. Yep. Looks like you guys got yourself into a very big project here. It is, and challenging. So, Niam, what, what was the vision when you guys came together and decided you're going to launch a phone with a wallet built into it? Um, so, it relies on, on two main uh, reasons. One, we already developed a very secure mobile device, the Solarin, uh, that was launched uh, back in May 2016. And two, that's the most used device in the world. Mobile phones, I don't know if you know, but there are 8 billion mobile devices in the world while there are only 7.7 .7 billion people in the world while there are only 4 billion toothbrushes. So, we so there are more mobile phones in the world than toothbrushes yes. in the world. So, what am I looking at here? Uh, so basically, you're one of the very few people, um, I would say the lucky people, to look at um, an almost final version of uh, the Fini uh, blockchain phone. Basically, um, this product is the product that's going to be released um, in a couple of months from now. And you can see the curved edges, 6-inch um, edge-to-edge um, Gorilla Glass, with basically um, two main things. One is the wallet and the other one is this center. This center is, is just like a Google Play. It's a, it's it's a, a dap store. It's a dap store. It's a dap store and an educational center. Um, but it also runs um, with a proprietary technology called the token conversion service. So basically when you're going to go into our Dapp dap store and education center and you're going to browse through uh, the recommended preloaded applications here, please, this is just placeholders and references. Don't. Uh, don't look at it as, uh, as the final version. The idea is that the user would not need to go into an exchange now and to obtain uh, the specific token to be used in, uh, in the DAP. From encrypted cell phones to compressing files, we continue our product launches with Agada, one of our crypto trader contributors and correspondents. Introducing us to a new name you'll all know pretty soon, .play. Uh, Play has created a new file type that allows not only to compress the file significantly, but also to control viewer rights. Wow, sounds amazing. You're going to be blown away by this. The tech behind this file compression is so groundbreaking that I had to break the ice with a game of pool before seeing the demo. So what is Play? Play is a new file type that, in contrary to other file types, um, it allows end users and companies to achieve three major goals that cannot be achieved today. The first thing is that Play can contain every type of digital data under a single file format. The second thing is, uh, almost, the second thing is that um, Play can actually take all, every type of data and reduce it to a fragment of its size. So for example, whenever you choose to take a video and convert it into the play file format, so let's say that that video weighs two gigabytes, after you convert it into um, the dot .play file format, it will be reduced to something like 20 kilobytes. And is this a reality? I mean, is this actually it, working today? It, yes, it is, it is. Okay, here we have two uh, standard uh, files and we have a video file. So how big is the file that we're looking at now? Okay, it's 90 megabytes. It's a move file and a trailer, The Incredibles. Okay. Which just came out of that too. And are you going to reduce this file? Yeah, I'm going to convert it into a play file and it's going to be reduced dramatically. So let's see. I'm going to drag it in. This is our platform. Um, now, I'm, it, when, when it's uploading, I'm going to choose um, how, many, how many times I want the, the person I'm sending it to to open the file, to be able to open the file, and how long I want him or she to watch it. Put on 30 minutes, I turn on acceleration, which utilizes the GPU instead of CPU. So it took 10 seconds to compress the file? Yeah. How big is the new file? The new file is 472 bytes. So you reduced 90 megabytes in 10 seconds to 472 bytes. Exactly. That's yeah. incredible. 
And now it's time to go to alignment. We went back to Moshe's singularity, this time to meet Roy, one of his lead funders. This time we wanted to get some real funding insights. So Roy, Alignment Group, you guys are the investment arm of the singularity team establishment. What are the type of investments that you guys make? What we like to feel as the common denominator is, is an infrastructure perspective. We believe the real opportunity right now is to help uh, propagate blockchain by improving the user experience and bringing it to the mainstream. Let's talk about the investments that you're making outside of the stable that is currently inside this building. Mm -hmm. What else are you investing in? The way we like to look at it is that we invest in entrepreneurs. We're very pro-entrepreneur, we're very quick with our decision making. Um, the diligence we perform is on the team and the quality of the team, and often we invest in serial entrepreneurs and, and teams with serial technologists. Um, so take for example, um, a company uh, that we're very happy and proud of is uh, Platin. Um, they're developing a proof of location protocol. Um, we believe that is the type of opportunity we should be supporting uh, both with capital raising and value-added services in terms of marketing, business development, and these sorts of things. What are your other investments? Um, we have a, a number of things. Another company uh, we're very excited about is called Space Mesh. Uh, it's developing uh, uh, an OS for the blockchain, if you will. Uh, there's Orbs I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, we're also invested in a variety of, of more passive type of, of, in, of investments, uh, such as uh, Cardano, such as Telegram, Tezos, uh, EOS, and these sorts of companies. What other investments excite you? Uh, another one that really excites us is uh, Don. Uh, what is Don is doing is uh, taking uh, a security approach to real estate. And what's exciting there is not just the general opportunity that they're going about, but the team that we can help uh, build that business out. And if I understand correctly, one of your ventures is to start a blockchain-only TV channel. Correct. Um, what we are actually building is a new blockchain-based uh, media organization with a TV channel at its core. What we believe is the opportunity is to bring blockchain to the mainstream audience by normalizing the, the subject matter and the space in general through the companies and the people building it. So this TV channel that you guys are starting, is it something that we can expect in the, in the near future? Uh, but yes, you can go to blocktv.com and you can sign up and we'll notify you when we're launching. Roy, it's such a pleasure having you on Crypto Trader. Likewise. A few floors up, Roy and Singularity team helped fund Stocks, a decentralized prediction market charting a new course with crypto. Good, so let me show you, man. This is our marketing team. I'm working on the next features, getting us more users to the more, to the more than 200,000 that we already have. And this is our development team working on the next version with major improvements to the, to the application and system. How many developers work here? How many engineers? We have about 12 developers working here. Okay. Cool features, improving the UI, improving the blockchain and connections. This is our product and UI team. Awesome. Well, let's go sit down. Yeah, sure. So Yossi, before we start, you said something like 200,000 users. That's correct. Is there a DAP that has 200,000 users? Not that I'm aware of. So, are you guys adept? We're, we are adept in some, in some ways. We're not 100% connected to the blockchain. We're not a completely decentralized DEP, but we have connection to the blockchain where we think there's a value to being on the blockchain. Okay, so what exactly is Stocks? Stocks is a blockchain prediction markets platform. It's Ethereum based and, and open source where anybody using a skill knowledge can generate this portion of stake by predicting the outcome of future events. Okay, prediction markets, I think the, the most famous token in prediction markets is certainly the Ogre, the Ogre platform with the REP token. What are prediction markets and why are they so important? Predictive markets are exchange-based markets intended for trading the, 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 the outcome of future events, where actually the probability of the, is what the crowd thinks will be the probability of the event to occur, actually. So it's like wisdom of the crowd? It is the wisdom of the crowd. It's, it refers to the idea that a collective group of people are smarter than any expert individual when it comes to problem solving. Okay, so let's talk about an actual example of a prediction market that actually is taking place on the stocks platform today. We, ask, we have predictions open from almost any imaginable category. We have a tournament running for the US Open at the moment, where so far 70% of the crowd is right. Uh, we have, we've had tournaments about the World Cup and Wimbledon, and we have prediction about specific companies how much are they going to raise during the ICO since we're related to the crypto, uh, crypto community. Okay, so who is actually using the stocks platform today? Our 200,000 users are consistent mainly from the blockchain community because we're working with a token, the STX token, which is the engine behind stocks. 
So in order to work on stocks, you need to have the STX token. So most of our community is from the, the crypto one. But we're slowly reaching out to the masses. So that's where we can bring the numbers, the 200,000. Then not all of them are from the crypto community. Now, you guys did a, a token a sale or a, a capital raise last year. Correct. How much money did you raise? We raised 148,000 ETH. 148,000 ETH. And it's well, equivalent to $34 million. Did, at the you, did you cash out the ETH for US dollars? Some of it, of course. That's what we pay for the rent here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> awesome. Any plans to decentralize? We're working slowly with the infrastructure. As the infrastructure moves forward and the technology, we are constantly looking for solutions for being more and more decentralized. And if our viewers want to get more information about stocks and maybe even participate in some prediction markets, oh. where can they go? Well, you can just come to our website, stocks.com. That's stocks, S-T-O? S-T-O-X.com. That's stocks.com. Stocks.com. Yes, it's been a great pleasure having you. Thank you very you. much Thank for you. having me. Next, a few floors down, and this time it's Saga, a stable coin that various VCs, including Agadaz, iCapital, and Singularity team, teamed up to fund, starting with its founder playing the piano in his office. Music to my ears. Ido, you know, before I came here, they warned me not to use the word stablecoin when I'm talking about Saga. <laughs> Why not? So we're not that touchy about it, but um, for me, a stablecoin is a technical solution. It's, it's a way of tokenizing an existing currency, and by all means, if it's not a currency. So in crypto, we, we face <coughs> with, at the moment, a few different types of coins. Mm -hmm. I think the first type of coin is the US dollar tether, and that really is a stablecoin, yes. or should be a stablecoin. Then you've got all these experiments in creating a new type of, uh, I hate to use the word stablecoin, but a, a, a new kind of currency that isn't pegged against the US dollar, but displays characteristics of a more stable type of currency. And that's projects like Terra, like Reserve, and like Saga. Okay, so what are you building at Saga? The problem we are trying to solve is, is the one of a global currency. Um, in the past 30 or 40 years, uh, we are witnessing an ever-growing scope of a global economy of, of more and more nationless products and nationless services, um, but we're still using only na national currencies, uh, sovereign currencies. And we believe there is merit, and history is uh, um, quite consistent uh, in showing that when there is a new scope of an economy, it requires a store of value and a medium of exchange, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. So let's talk about Saga and how Saga actually works. So, Saga is built on three main pillars. Uh, the first one is the acknowledgement that we are first and foremost a monetary startup before we are a technology startup because we're trying to solve a monetary uh, problem, uh, which is to create a global co uh, currency. And therefore, this startup is led by an interdisciplinary effort of economists, uh, uh, physicists, mat mathematicians, and technology experts as well. Uh, two main issues, the, the two uh, remaining pillars, one is the one of volatility, where we're actually copying uh, central banks in the past 100 years and modeling it algorithmically um, on chain. Um, we, are, we have developed a model of a variable fractional reserve, which means that when we go out, um, we are fully backed by uh, the SDR, which is a, a basket of currencies determined by the IMF. Um, and so Saga doesn't have an intrinsic value because it doesn't enjoy trust to have an intrinsic value. But as more Sagas are being uh, um, produced and, and the market determines the production of Saga, it's a fully elastic supply of uh, money model, um, then the reserve ratio decreases gradually like a debasement of a currency in favor of the appreciation of Saga, which would be slower than the appreciation of... So it's very similar to the old days when we used to back 100% of the currency in gold. Right. You're saying that instead of gold, it's a, ba it's a basket of currencies as defined by the IMF. Right. Yep. And as people form more trust, so does the system become less and less dependent on this currency. Now, when you talk about this basket of fiat currencies, where is the basket of fiat currencies being stored? So th that's an important element <coughs> as well. It is being stored in regulated banks. Um, currently, our uh, uh, home jurisdiction is Switzerland, and so we are supervised by FINMA, by the Financial um, uh, Regulatory Authority in, in Switzerland. And those banks are the ones that are attesting for how much they hold in reserve on a daily basis. But that no one is, is supposed to trust us that we actually hold a reserve. Can I invest in the Saga project? Is there an avenue for investors to buy into the Saga project? 
The way we did it is that we created a second, car, a second token called Saga Genesis, which you can consider to be a, a pre-modeled call option on the Saga. So anyone holding a Saga Genesis can send it to the contract and get Saga instead. How many Saga will we get? That depends on the size of the Saga economy. Currently, if our investors send their tokens to the contract, they'll get zero Saga, because as long as Saga is 100% backed by currency, we don't have anything to distribute them. Um, but, but then as the economy grows, um, then the conversion ratio of Saga Genesis to Saga grows with it, and it's capped by, by 15 times the Saga, because case we succeed in being uh, a global uh, complementary currency. We don't want our investors to be the controller of such an economy. So um, you've, you've kept your investor returns at 15x? At 15x on the Saga, the Saga appreciates as well. So it's, uh, the, their actual return is higher, but their additional return to the one of Saga holders is capped to 15x. Yeah. Ido, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a long and winding road covering all things Israel. And to wind down, we're in Jaffa, the old city of Tel Aviv, to meet the much talked about Chromaway, a project who's distributed worldwide, but their founder came to meet me for a cup of coffee. After spending my days here in Tel Aviv, going from office to office and meeting the most exciting blockchain projects, I decided I need some time out and to catch a cup of Arab coffee in the old city of Jaffa. I'm here with Or Perlman, who's the COO and founder of Chromaway. Oh, it's so good to see you. Tell us what Chromaway actually is. Well, so we started really, really early back uh, in the early days, 2014. Uh, and most recently we developed a new uh, kind of blockchain which we call Chromapolis. And what we basically do is combining relational databases with uh, uh, blockchains. Now, a lot of our viewers aren't very technical people. So what does that mean in non-technical speak? to combine relational databases with blockchains? Well, it gives us a lot of good advantages in terms of other competitive, com competitive platforms. For example, you don't need to learn any kind of solidity in order to develop on top of our uh, blockchain. You only need to, to use uh, uh, SQL, which is basically 80% of the developers in the world actually know how to develop it. So it reduces the lower barrier to entry to the market in a developer point of view. Uh, we can host a lot of data in terms of on-chain data. So basically we can, uh, uh, dApps that want to be developed on top of our platform can be actually uh, uh, be hosted in, in the entire, the, the entire backend of their app on top of us. Uh, that's true. Uh, third, there is a big problem in blockchains today where you cannot search on the blockchain, you cannot uh, do normal features that any kind of database does. And we are solving this with our platform, so you can actually do a lot of nice database features automatically without any uh, uh, tooling or layers or whatever. So you can store much more data on the blockchain now without storing it off-chain, which is what most companies are actually doing. Correct. And that allows you to search and to perform a whole lot of, tron whole lot of functions which ordinarily you can't do on the chain. Correct. Yeah. Now, oh, raising money in this market must be an absolute nightmare. Are you guys managing to raise money? Well, we did. Uh, luckily, but uh, that's mainly as well because of our history in the space, uh, as well uh, because as you know we are coming really, really old, uh, as well my CTO and, uh, and the team as well, coming from the old color coins days, which was kind of like the first way to issue ERC20 on top of uh, uh, Bitcoin, to, uh, the first way to issue any kind of assets uh, at all. So we have a track record as well of actually implementing software in, in the blockchain world and we have uh, and we actually developed our technology based on what our customer actually needs. So we know what enterprises want and that is why we did it. And when can we expect to see some kind of testnet or mainnet? So testnet comes uh, next month uh, and mainnet is coming uh, in around the, the November, December, around those dates. Okay, now oh, if our viewers want more information about your project, where can they go? Comapolis.com So I'm here with Adrian Bashuk. He's one of the producers of CNBC Crypto Trader, but also a long-time journalist covering war zones and disaster areas. And he's here to help us look for real-world adoption of blockchain. Yeah, Ron, I'll be focusing on blockchain use cases. So right now in Tel Aviv, the DLD Tech Conference is going on. We've got innovators from around the globe who are here focused on technology. So who are we talking to? We're going to be talking to the accelerator program of the UN World Food Program. We're here in Tel Aviv, but I think it's important to take a wider look at the region of the Middle East in general, where the opportunity to implement blockchain is so much greater. 
Is that what we can expect? Absolutely. We're going to take it to the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan where you're going to see they've built their own blockchain on top of Ethereum and are issuing payments to refugees. So as part of our quest to find blockchain in use in the field, we're talking with the World Food Program's Accelerator. Um, so he'll tell us what is going on in Jordan. So um, Building Blocks is uh, WFP's implementation of blockchain technology. And what we're uh, using it in is in our uh, cash-based transfers activities. And that's when we uh, provide cash um, to vulnerable populations. In this case, uh, we are providing um, a uh, solution on an Ethereum backend. Uh, walk me through the steps of how the program actually works. Okay. Uh, displaced Refugee is in a camp controlled by the UN, and the World Food Program has a supermarket. What happens? When the family goes, buys the food that they need for the family, and then they go to the cashier, and in this case, um, they get identified uh, using their iris of their eyes, right. and so it, then it's ocular technology. Yeah, and right. then yes, and then um, the system validates that that's the person that has that amount of cash and whether that cash exists in the in their account, and then they can purchase the food for their families. When you're talking about vulnerable populations, there's none more vulnerable than Syrian refugees that have clearly made headlines over the last number of years. How many people are we talking about being helped by blockchain in this case right now? So right now we're uh, supporting more than 100,000 refugees in two refugee camps in Jordan, Zatari and El Azraq. And next you have projected to help even more, yeah? Yeah, so we're planning to scale throughout Jordan and we're also looking into other locations um, as the need grows. Let's talk benefits. Yes. Has the World Food Program saved money by implementing this? In this case, we have seen saving of costs because we are changing the way that we work with the bank. So we still use the bank. The bank is not uh, totally out of the process. Record keeping, for example. Of course, yes, and record keeping is super important. So for us, we can see every time a transaction happens, there's a hash on the blockchain and it's immutable. And it's, it also is real time, and we, which is usually very good for us because we can track it and we can make sure the privacy of the information. So yeah. Now, Ron, our host, as you know, is from South Africa, and he's always said that it's Africa and the impoverished and the unbanked that really need the blockchain. So shout out to Ron on that. <laughs> and that is true, that it is the unbanked that maybe could be banks using a prototype like this, yeah? Um, well, the I think we're also looking into diverse use cases, and I think the topic of unbanked or digital identity is a topic that I, is very, let's say, discussed quite a lot, but I think there's also still a lot of homework to be done and to find what is the right uh, solution. Now we have a special call out to any devs out there, especially part of the accelerator in the World Food Program. What are you looking for? You're, you're open to startups, yeah? Yeah, so we're looking for startups from all around the world that have innovations uh, relevant for our operations to end global hunger. So whether you're a startup looking into supply chain, blockchain, artificial intelligence, drone, emergency response, really, we really are very operational. So we've met a lot of devs at a lot of conferences and heard a lot of hype. We're issuing you a challenge. So if you want to make a difference, apply to innovation.wfp.org to put blockchain in action. That was a real whirlwind tour of Israel. We saw some amazing projects and had a fantastic time. But now it's time for us to fly to Singapore to cover consensus. Until next week, I'll be on Twitter at CryptoManRun, and you should trade well, my friends. <laughs>